Coming up, OCO on the road. We take you west of the Cherokee Nation to California, where thousands of our citizens have immigrated since the 1800s. Charles Twist has lived in California most of his life. He tells us how he's maintained his cultural identity thousands of miles away, and how he's used his heritage and spirituality to create a community around him. I use Cherokee stories to tell them things, uh, and I, I teach kind of out of that story element so that they have to make a conclusion. Plus, she's Will Rogers' great-granddaughter. My number one goal is to go out and, and educate people on who he was and what he did. How Jennifer Rogers Echeverry carries on the family name and how she infuses humor into her almond business. And he's a Cherokee Nation citizen dubbed the Juggernaut, an undefeated Muay Thai champion. We would train twice a day, six days a week. So I really actually basically destroyed all my opponents. How his cultural curiosity led him to the combat sport and why his technique is now sought after by some of the toughest fighters in Northern California. The Cherokees. A thriving American Indian tribe. Our history. Our culture. Our people. Our future. The principles of a historic nation sewn into the fabric of a modern world. Hundreds of thousands strong. Learning growing, succeeding, and steadfast. In the past, we have persevered through struggle. But the future is ours to write. OCO. 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 These are the voices of the Cherokee people. OCO, I'm Principal Chief Bill John Baker. Welcome to the Cherokee Nation and OCO TV. This is how we share our culture, our heritage, our history, and our language with you. What do? OCO, it's how we say hello in Cherokee. In this episode, we take OCO on the road out west to sunny California, where there are more than 20,000 Cherokee Nation citizens. Out here, we'll introduce you to Will Rogers' great-granddaughter and businesswoman Jennifer Rogers Echeverry, and a Cherokee Nation citizen who found a connection with Thai culture and for years has been training people in Muay Thai combat. But first, Charles Twist. He was raised here in California, but has always kept a deep and spiritual connection to his Cherokee heritage. The fire is an integral part of my life. I'm grateful that I get to go to the grounds and I get to be where the fire is. But, you know, I'm, I'm living in California, so I want to keep that memory alive. So many times what I find Cherokee people get away from where there's that opportunity and they forget that they're Cherokee. And, and my father never wanted me to forget who I was. So you kind of ingrain that in us. So the fire is part of my life. It's, a, it's a pretty much a daily thing that I get up in the morning and I, I start a fire and, and I spend the time alone so I can hear and think and listen. That's my morning, offering smoke for people and for things that are revealed to me while I'm there at the fire. I am Charles Twist. I teach at a men's home. We're dealing with people that would either be in that home or prison uh, because of drug or alcohol abuse. And so uh, we're mentoring them that they have, there's a different way to live life than what they've lived. And they're people that have either been thrown away or they've thrown themselves away. And so when somebody cares about them and somebody's consistent and they can find value, and then I, I get to give them that just by being something for them at that moment in time. It's a purpose that I feel comfortable with. I use Cherokee stories to tell them things, uh, and I, I teach kind of out of that story element so that they have to make a conclusion. One of them is, uh, is the story of Ukon, the Shining One, and the warrior that he was in battle with, and the promise that was made. There's an there's a angel called Ukon, who's the, in Cherokee that means shining bright. And then there was another one. There was another man. And they're struggling back and forth. And so up walks, let's say, 
you walk up. And so as the struggle's going on, Ukon cries out and he says, you know, if you'll help me, I'll give you wealth, I'll give you position, and I'll give you things that'll benefit you. The other warrior, he cries out, he says, if you will help me, I'll give you medicine. And if I give you medicine, I'll give you knowledge. I'll give you something that you can give to somebody else. I'll give you something that will help you forever. And so there's always that choice, see? We, we're, we're always at a place of choosing. Some things are now. So we have to choose between life like that a lot of times. There's, there's something that can help us forever. And through that help, we get to help everybody. That's medicine. And when you use medicine, we get to help a lot of people. If we just use something temporary, it'll go away. So the man made a good choice and he killed the shining one. So medicine came into the Cherokee hands. And I'm, I'm grateful for that man. He gave me hope today. My father was from Locust Grove, Oklahoma. He's actually born in Salisaw, and that's where his roots came from. We moved away from Oklahoma as a family in, in 42. His father told him, what's going on on Locust Grove is not much. And he said that, you know, if you would go to the West, then that you would have opportunities that you'll never have here. My dad found a job, found a future for me and my brothers. Out of that, we just set our roots down and we stayed here. And so we had Cherokee ways wherever we were. So when we lived in Bakersfield, we brought those ways down here and we, pr we practiced and talked about those things. We went to Stomps when we went to Oklahoma, so we learned ceremonial ways of doing things. That, but it was short term for us as children, but he retained all of that and he spoke to us about those things, taught us the things I believe that we needed to know and mainly, he taught us about Cherokee community. In our upbringing, community was the key issue. Uh, we, ha we have to be able to, if we're gonna be Cherokee, we have to have a community. We have to honor that community, take care of that community, help that community grow. I think that's motivated me to help begin a community here in Bakersfield. There's a lot of Cherokees here. In Bakersfield, during the uh, Depression era, there was a time uh, I've been told that approximately 15 or 20,000 Cherokee people left Oklahoma within a two, three week span of time. The bulk of those people came to Kern County. Some of them went to Los Angeles and some went north into the Sacramento area, but the bulk of those people came here. And in the early days when they had uh, picnics here, it was not uncommon to have five, 6,000 Cherokee people come to a picnic. But to be in Bakersfield, it was just, it was the right place to be because there was this, we have this, we have work opportunity, and we have each other. Since we started the satellite community here, at least three times a year, we have somebody from Tahlequah here uh, to bring cultural issues up. And, and maybe it's, we've had baskets, we've made pottery, so we could actually connect that community. And I think that's what keeps me here is the desire to make that connection greater than it is. I yeah, come to water because that's what Cherokee people do. If we use our Cherokee ways, it'll cause a lot of people to flourish and make our community stronger. Jennifer Rogers Echeverry is the great granddaughter of America's favorite son and Cherokee Nation citizen, Will Rogers. She's a successful businesswoman and owner of an almond company. But just like Will, she doesn't take herself too seriously. I'm probably the one in the family, I, well, I'm, I'm definitely voted, I can tell you this, by my family, is being the most, most talkative. And um, I'm, not shy, I'm not too shy, if you can tell. My name is Jennifer Rogers Echeverry. I was born and raised in Bakersfield. And I'm also blessed to be a great-granddaughter of Will Rogers. 
pretty much lived here my adult life. Bakersfield is located in the San Joaquin Valley, and San Joaquin Valley is truly the heart of agriculture for, uh, for the United States. So I met my husband, uh, he's a third generation farmer here in Bakersfield from a family that I grew up knowing. We have two children, my daughter is 25 and married and just gave us our first grandson. And my son is going to be a senior in college at Prescott, Arizona. Well, it's been a gradual process, um, stepping into the role that I that I play. My number one goal is to go out and, and educate people on who he was and what he did. Um, I've had the honor of meeting a lot of a lot of people, from celebrities to just people that remember Will Rogers. There's still a very small generation that remember him, that were alive, and and tell about the day that he died and how their father pulled over the car on the on the side of the road. Everybody was pulled over and people were crying. And he people have told me stories. You know, as a child, they were like, "What ha what happened?" Will Rogers State Historic Park. Uh, is the place where, where Will Rogers lived at the time of his death. I sit on a foundation that helps support that park as long as a foundation in Oklahoma which supports the museum, the Will Rogers Memorial Museum in his birthplace. I get to travel to Oklahoma just about every other month. It just seems like every time I'm back there I've learned something new or I've met somebody new and it's always a, a different aspect of Will's life. My job as the family spokesperson and family member is to keep his legacy alive because he was so important to America. And at the time of his death, he had made over 70 movies. He had written six books. He had a daily newspaper column that reached 40 million readers a day. That is unbelievable. And he gave a weekly radio address. He was the highest paid um, actor of his time back then. There's nobody that can even come close to the things that he did and he did it all in 55 short years. I, I, I think I have a little bit of that, of that humor in me from Will Rogers. I'd like to think that that's where it came from. And you have to have humor, you have to have fun. And, and that's what got Will Rogers so far in his life, poking fun at the President of the United States. We must have some 80 or 90,000 people here tonight. That's the most people that ever paid to see a politician. <laughs> he he would come out and just say it, but he could get away with it because he did it in such a way that um, it, it made them laugh and they embraced him even more. I get asked a lot, how did I start my business? When we planted um, our almonds, the market was at an all-time high, which was just over $4 a pound. And if you know anything about the almond market, it takes about five years to start showing a profit. And so, of course, that, that year came for us to show a profit, and the market had taken a plunge to an all-time low. Weather's a big factor, and the, uh, uh, the drought has caused problems because we don't have the moisture, the fog, and the um, chilling units that we need for a perfect almond crop. California droughts. <laughs> Well, this Christmas, I was getting the same speech of how this year's gonna be better, next year be better, and I finally just put my, my hand down and said, you know, every year you say it's gonna get better and it never does. What do I have to do, go sell your nuts for you? And we joked about it, and my dad was there, and my brother, and my brother's the one that came up with the name, I have to give him the credit. He said, oh, you could call it my husband's nuts. And um, we just kind of joked about it for a little while, and then, Oh, a couple months later, my dad called, and he was living in Tennessee at the time, and he said, I was telling somebody jokingly about the story, My Husband's Nuts, and they want to trademark it, and I think maybe we should check into it. So we said, well, we'll trademark it. So we did, trademarked it, and um, that's just kind of how it was born. I always say that um, with the embarrassment that goes along with it, uh, you know, if she could make a million dollars a year, I could put up with the embarrassment. <laughs> I'm blessed, I'm honored to, um, to be part of the Cherokee Nation. And I'm thrilled that every time they come to California, I try to attend some of their events. And um, that's a whole side of Will's life that, um, that is probably the most important. If Will Rogers was alive today, he was most proud of his Cherokee heritage. And he wasn't shy to, to share that information. He was very proud to be Cherokee. And that's one thing I'm so blessed to be here today is, is to show that side of my heritage because a lot of people don't know about it. So I was very, very honored.
to, to be here today. John Rollin Ridge is well known for writing the novel The Life and Adventures of Joaquin Murrieta. It is the first novel written by a Native American and one of the first novels that was written in California. He contributed to a number of magazines and he was also an editor for a couple of newspapers out in California. He was born in the old Cherokee Nation East in 1827. He was the son of John Ridge, who was one of the signers of the Treaty of New Echota. There were two factions that existed in the Cherokee Nation during the time of removal. You have the Ross Party, who fought to hold on to our lands back east, and then you had the Treaty Party, who thought that removal was going to be inevitable. What we should do is go ahead and accept the best deal that we can get and remove to the west. John Ridge, Major Ridge, and Elias Boudinot were all executed for their role in signing the Treaty of New Echota. John Rollin Ridge uh, witnessed his father's murder. He was 12 years old. If you look at his writings, he often spoke about revenge, that he seeked revenge um, for the killings of his father, his grandfather, and also Elias Boudinot, his cousin. John Rollin Ridge was definitely a controversial figure, especially with his politics. He was a a big supporter of the Confederacy. He advocated for a separate Cherokee Nation. While the Ross Party was fighting to keep the Cherokee Nation united, during the mid to late 1840s, uh, John Rollin Ridge had a dispute with a member of the Ross Party. He ended up killing the man, and he would flee to Missouri. After living there for a while with his wife and daughter, he eventually would join and go with the gold rush out to California, and then later his wife and daughter joined him out there. He ends up writing and contributes to a number of magazines. He is well known for being the founding editor of the Sacramento Bee, which is still in print today. John Rollin Ridge would build a home about 30 minutes north of Sacramento, and that's where he would end up spending the last of his days. He's also buried in the cemetery there, along with his wife, his daughter, and his brother. Let's talk Cherokee. June. De Haluyi. De Haluyi. We have tornadoes in June. De Haluyi. Kotla. Agalugi. De Galoskoi. De Haluyi. De Haluyi. Kotla. Kotla. Agalugi. Agalugi. Fish. Ajati. Ajati. I'm going to catch a fish. Ajati. Tachi ni yahi. Ajati. Ajati. Tachi ni yahi. Aji ni yahi. Apple. Sakta. Sakta. I'm making an apple pie. Sakta. Gayliski go tlaska. Sakta. Sakta. Gayliski. Gayliski. Go tlaska. Go tlaska. Ty Elliott is a Cherokee Nation citizen living in Sacramento, California. He's trained in Muay Thai combat and for years has immersed himself in the Thai culture, training some of the best in that unique sport. Ty Elliott, I'm a Muay Thai trainer and I'm a 
I'm a student. I was born in Vallejo, California, but then when I was about two, we moved back to Oklahoma. I lived there until I was about 10, and then I moved to uh, Davis, California. All my family's in Oklahoma now. I'm just, I'm the only one out here. When I was kind of just out of high school, I was playing around learning some Laos. I guess I was just really intrigued with, with languages. Then I went to Thailand to, uh, to learn Thai fluently. I went there for the intention of, of learning how to speak Thai. You know, just by being in Thailand, um, I was able to, to just speak. That's what really taught me how to learn Thai. Rather than going to an expensive school or, you know, um, something like that, I, I actually always wanted to do Muay Thai. Muay Thai is actually Thailand's national sport. It's, it's, more like, it's more like boxing or kickboxing. I had a, a Thai friend, and they searched on the internet, and the very first one that showed up was uh, the gym called uh, Kai Moi Seng Tianoi. I didn't really know it at the time, but Seng Tianoi was actually like a superstar in Thailand, and he's really famous. And, um, we would train twice a day, six days a week, if you were you know, planning to fight. And I didn't really want to compete um, at first, but then eventually, they, uh, they convinced me to, to do it, and then, you know, then I wound up doing well. I won all 48 fights. It was 48 and 0. So I really actually basically destroyed all my opponents. And then that's how I got the nickname, the Juggernaut. I stopped competing in Muay Thai because, in my opinion, it's really hard to be really good at the sport if you can't do it, you know, all day. <laughs> We had some police officers um, come and start just a, a police class. The first time I met him, I thought he was the goofiest guy I ever seen, honestly. And I thought, there was, this, he's a TIE fighter, there's no way. There's no way. He would be probably the guy I'm, I'm going to be picking in the bar after a couple of drinks and things like that. And then I saw him working on the heavy bags. I was like, yeah, I would pick on this guy at the bar, and I'll probably wake up in the hospital. I take Muay Thai because I feel like the, the contained environment in a gym is wonderful for learning, but it also translates really well into a non-contained environment on the street. From little stuff from just body presentation to big stuff like getting in fights on the street, it translates into everyday life as a police officer, really. And it keeps me safe and it makes me come home to my family. You know, I started training with him when I was 19 years old, and I just turned 27 this year. Took me all the way to a title fight, and uh, it's not over. He definitely is a big, uh, big deal to me because you know he was there when uh, when I didn't really have many people, you know, in my life. I just do private lessons, um, teaching uh, Muay Thai, and um, I'm a student at uh, Sacramento City College. Um, I'm learning uh, video game development and computer programming. It started by a friend, a good friend of mine, telling me, hey, we can make a video game. With game development, to be able to do it, they have teams of people who specialize. But I was so hard-headed that I wouldn't listen, and they, everyone said it's not possible, but I did do it. I spent two years basically studying 16 hours a day. When I wake up, I would study until I went to sleep. <laughs> You can't just put an average output and then be, be really good. After I finish college, I plan to study the Cherokee language and uh, I plan to also try to learn to read and write it. They were saying that, you know, like it's fewer and fewer people and very, it's very rare that people are um, speaking Cherokee anymore. To me, I, I plan to learn it because it's just, it's a part of me and if I did learn all these other languages, you know, I feel like I, I should learn Cherokee as well. People did tell me that I wasn't, wasn't going to be able to be an interpreter. They were, oh, you'll never learn, be able to learn it. But to me, I guess uh, that's motivation. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed our show. And remember, you can always watch entire episodes and share your favorite stories online at OCO.TV. There is no Cherokee word for goodbye. We say, Donadago Hai. We'll see each other again. 
So until next time, Wado. It's your turn to visit the Cherokee Nation and explore 66,000 acres of lush Oklahoma countryside, scenic lakes and rivers, and engaging cultural attractions like the Cherokee Heritage Center in Park Hill, Oklahoma. Built in 1967, the Cherokee Heritage Center is a great place to immerse yourself in Cherokee culture, history, and art. The Cherokee Heritage Center includes the Cherokee National Museum, the Cherokee Family Research Center, our National Archives, Adams Corner Rural Village, and Diligua, a replica of a 1710 Cherokee village. The site of the Cherokee Heritage Center is itself historic. It's built on the original grounds of the Cherokee National Female Seminary, the first institution of higher learning for women west of the Mississippi. Thousands of women, both Cherokee and non-Cherokee, received world-class educations at the seminary until it burned in 1887. It was rebuilt in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, but today, three of the original school's columns mark the entrance to the Heritage Center. Inside, you'll find the Cherokee National Museum, where visitors can learn the history of Cherokee Nation through several exhibits, from our original homelands in the southeastern U.S., across the Trail of Tears to Indian Territory, and into Oklahoma statehood and beyond. The gallery space at the Heritage Center is home to the annual Cherokee Homecoming Art Show and Sale and the Trail of Tears Art Show, as well as other temporary and traveling exhibits. Diligua is the most popular cultural attraction in the Cherokee Nation. Situated on the Heritage Center grounds, Diligua is a historically accurate replica of a Cherokee village from the year 1710, after European contact. Visitors take a guided tour of the village and experience authentic Cherokee life and history learn the purpose behind each structure and how our Cherokee ancestors made and traded everyday goods, from basket and finger weaving to flint napping and moccasins. You can even catch a game of stickball. The Cherokee Heritage Center is open year-round. To learn more and to plan your next visit, go to visitcherokeenation.com. In the Cherokee Nation, news happens every day. Cherokee Nation's economic impact on the state of Oklahoma now exceeds $2 billion. The dollars that are generated here are creating jobs. It benefits everyone. Creating headlines. The new 469,000 square foot health facility is the result of the largest joint venture agreement ever. For the people of the Cherokee Nation, it will impact them for generations to come. Creating opportunities. Cherokee Nation employees can now take eight weeks of paid maternity leave. We have lots of young mothers and young families, and this is something that's very exciting. This year, the tribe awarded $5 million to superintendents from about 100 public school districts. When it comes to education, we're all in it together. Creating a better place to call home. The Wilma P. Mankiller Health Center in Stillwell, Oklahoma, nearly doubled in size. But this absolutely will make a tremendous impact on the quality of life. It's going to provide more jobs. For more Cherokee Nation news, visit onadiscoe.com.